I'm going to start off by introducing myself for those who don't know me. My name is Michael Mercurio. I am a January 2017 graduate of the Leslie MFA program. Uh, I'm a poet. I'm also the executive director of Cambridge Common Writers, which is an alumni organization for our program. And tonight, thanks to Danielle legros George, who's director of the MFA program, Cambridge Common Writers is delighted to bring you five incredible alums who are gonna share their work with you. Before we get started, I'd like to just touch on some basic ground rules for how this reading will work. Presumably at this point in the global pandemic, you've used Zoom before and know that it's considered good manners to keep yourselves muted if you're not the person reading. We're gonna leave the chat open so that you can share your enthusiasm for the work that way. But fair warning that anyone posting hateful or offensive comments, including anything racist, sexist, anti-queer, anti-trans, ableist, that's gonna get you ejected from the reading. We're here to celebrate, not denigrate. We recommend keeping Zoom set to speaker view rather than gallery view to allow you to have the best view of our readers, but I'm not gonna micromanage that. You wanna keep it in gallery view? I'm not gonna get on it. Before I turn things over to my colleague, Julia Leaf, to introduce our first reader, I do wanna say a special thanks to the Cambridge Common Writers Board for the work they've done to help organize this event and to build this robust organization to support and celebrate our fellow Leslie MFA alums. So thank you to Rex Arasmith, Robbie Gamble, Julia Leaf, Akila Calderate, Britt, Jin Hoke, Tyler Dean Kemp, and Maria Tyre, as well as special thanks to Craig Garland, whose technical acumen has made all of this possible. Julia? All right, thank you, Michael. It's so good to see everyone tonight. So it is my absolute pleasure to introduce Akila C. Britt. Some of you may know her already as one of the board members of Cambridge Common Writers, and still others will remember her from our time in the program just a few short years ago. In addition to her MFA in fiction from Lesley University, Akila holds a BA in social work and a master of social work. She currently works as an academic advisor in the School of Social Work at Simmons University, of which she is an alum. She writes most often about LGBTQ identified black and brown kids trying to live their best lives. And that her career in child protection often serves as a backdrop to her stories. I've been reading Akila's work for years now. She doesn't shy away from the messy stuff or those small personal traumas that make up the everyday lives of young people. And still there is a great deal of love and determination in her stories, a sureness that no matter how dark or desperate the circumstances seem, her characters will rise out of them stronger and more certain of themselves than ever. She has a talent for well-rounded and varied characters, a wonderful ear for dialogue, and a dozen stories in her head at any given time, one of which we have the pleasure of listening to tonight. So without further ado, Akila C. Britt. Hi, thank you, Julia. Thank you, Cambridge Common Writers. Hello, everyone. Um, very briefly, this piece was born from a prompt. Uh, it's still growing, and the working title right now is When Orphans Give Speeches. <clears throat> Marcus has never given a speech before. He has never spoken openly about anything of real importance. He has never even used the word orphan before. It is not something kids like Marcus say to describe their situation. Perhaps because orphan means one must have dead parents. Marcus does not have dead parents. Most kids like Marcus do not have dead parents. They have unavailable ones. This is what he reminds his social worker. She is young and she is eager and she is a black woman named Jamila who sees something in Marcus he has yet to see in himself. You have a story to tell. Her words are casual, always chill. Unlike his previous worker, Carol, the one who always sat too close to him, the one with wispy hair and freckled skin, the one who spoke with therapeutic inflections because somebody told her, this is how you speak to big black boys. Jamila speaks to Marcus like he is one of her homies. He cannot help but think how she will grow to hate this job one day, how she will be easily replaced 
It does not stop her from trying to encourage him. It does not stop him from listening. I mean, come on. You're a prime example of why this entire system is failing. How long you been in care? Six years? And you've never been in a foster home? Jamila lets this sink in. She crosses one leg over the other as if she just said the most profound thing. Marcus slouches deep into an armchair, one of those boxy chairs made of unfinished wood, the kind cushion with scratchy thin fabric, the kind better suited for a university common room, not the living room of this group home. A grin yanks the corner of Jamila's lips, like she can relate to him, like she's actually invested in him. Marcus eyes her newly released Jordans, her locked hair, her tattoos, her piercings. He is still trying to decide if she can be trusted. Kids like Marcus trudge through disappointment. Don't nobody give two shits about what I got to say. What a reason to say it. Marcus slides bare toes into the sheath of black brandless flip-flops. He stretches the aches from his continuously growing body and pushes himself upright. He knows genetics dealt him a raw deal that being inches past six feet tall and painted the darkest of browns makes it easy to forget that he's still a child. In some ways, his features are still prepubescent, just a faint dusting above his top lip, a few tightly coiled strands springing from his chin Jamila regards him. He reminds her of her brother, the one who never made it past 16. This will be good for you, she says. This is how your voice is heard. Marcus smirks audaciously. What? I'm supposed to stand in the front of a bunch of bougie white people and tell them how I'm here because my mom likes to smoke that shit and ain't nobody out there willing to take me? That I feel like I'm being punished for shit I have no control over? Man, fuck that. Marcus plops hard into the armchair. Tucks bald fist under each armpit. A male staff member almost as big as Marcus lingers in the doorway. He is brash and ready to intervene. With one look, Jamila assures him it's unnecessary. Why you care so much anyway? Why are you convinced, so convinced that me speaking at some foster care thing is gonna make a difference? Like they actually see me as anything other than some badass kid. Several boys who had been a backbeat to this conversation are now a symphony of yo bro, and real talk. Jamila waits a tick before answering. Because you're not some badass kid. None of you are. You're passionate resilient, creative. She thrust a thumb toward a painfully quiet 14 year old named Joshua. He is never without a sketchbook. A kid who draws as if the entire world is a blank piece of canvas reliant on his stroke to exist. Yet his smile is unfamiliar with compliments. I get it. You feel like you'll never get past this one moment in your life. But it's just a brick in the road. More like an entire road full of cobblestone. Facts, they say. They all laugh. Then they're serious again. Like Jamila's words are infused with gold flecks. Like they are trying to figure out how to bottle it. You have an opportunity. Maybe they won't look like you or me. And sure, some of them will have their minds made up about the type of kids living in group homes but more the reason to give this speech. Demolish their preconceived notions. Make them see you. Marcus rubs his fingertips across his lips then does the same across his forehead. He looks at every single kid in that room with him, a motley crew of outgrown fades and questionable hygiene, a hodgepodge of stutters and illiteracy, a firestorm of emotions, the kind that are typically drowned or sliced or transposed into billowing clouds. His heart beats like a taiko drum. 
I, I, I'll do it. The room erupts. In a week's time on the second Sunday in May, Marcus walks into the banquet room of a four-star hotel. The banner arch in the entrance reads, where hope begins. The irony is not lost on him. He examines the tables draped in white linen cloth, the gold rim plates garnished with the rinds of fresh fruit, the remnants of soft cheese smeared on half-eaten crackers, water that sits untouched in fancy glasses with slices of lemon bobbing like apples. He trails Jamila's footsteps, moving past belly laughs and back slaps, traversing around one arm hugs and double cheek kisses. He constricts himself to ease through the caverns of impassioned conversations. Scents walked all around him. Carving boards overflowing with braised ham and roasted chicken gurgled through him. He can almost taste it, almost see the juices dripping. He is enthralled by the cacophony of indulgence. He and Jamila had McDonald's before arriving. It's like Thanksgiving, he says. Jamila stops to take in her surroundings. It always is. They find their way into an alcove by the stage where Marcus stands in khakis that barely reach his ankles. The cuffs brush against the swoosh of white Nike socks. His Jordans have seen far better days. The busted stitching makes them seem like flea market knockoffs. His button shirt is oversized and deeply tucked, but he is rocking a fresh lineup. Jamila secures his paisley printed tie into a half Windsor knot. You know you got this, right? Just be yourself. Marcus flips through his note cards. That's the only way I know how to be. He's something short of confident. There is a sequence of hellos and may I have your attention. Bustling conversation turns to murmurs, turns to throats clearing, turns to fancy glasses clipping the edges of gold rim plates as sips are taken. The call of a toddler in search of mama rings out. Then there are the basic things that happen at banquets, such as acknowledgments and too many introductions. When he steps in front of the podium, he is met with a kaleidoscope of lights blinging from low hanging chandeliers in stark silence. A bottle of spring water sits on the shelf in front of him. His swallows are thick. He takes a sip, shuffles his note cards and decides to wing it. He looks around the room as if he's searching for something. Then he locks eyes with one of the only black faces that is not a waiter or a custodian. It is the father of the toddler now snuggled tightly in his arms. His heartbeat amplifies. He guzzles almost the entire bottle before he starts speaking, but when he does, this is what he says. I'm supposed to stand up here and tell you about my life. Tell you how I went to school one day and never went back home. How two strangers came and put me in their car and all they could say was that my mom was sick. My mom told me to never talk to strangers. She says strangers will tell you anything just to get you in their car, just to do bad things. She said if anyone ever tried to take me that I should kick and scream and cry and do whatever I had to. She never told me about the strangers who had permission to take me. The ones who showed up with the cops at their side the ones who picked me up off my feet and called the ambulance because I was being too wild, because I was scared. I don't think my mom realized that doing the exact thing she told me to do would mean never having a normal childhood. The man with the toddler sits with jaws clenched. He blinks a few times and dabs the corners of his eyes. There is a cough in the audience. A cell phone rings. The scramble to silence it is met with stretch necks and all eyes are back on Marcus. He releases a tight breath. 
I'm supposed to tell you how I spent the past six years of my life living in programs. But that was never the right fit. But why do I gotta be a fit? We're kids. We get angry. Make bad decisions. That don't mean we don't deserve our homes. Marcus slowly drinks the last of his water. He closes his eyes and all he can see is his mother's smile. He thinks about how she would sing him to sleep at night, how she caressed his cheeks, kissed his forehead, how even in her darkest moments, she always said she loved him. He thinks about how today is Mother's Day. Marcus does not know how long he has been standing at this podium with his eyes closed and saturated with memories, but when he opens them, it is at the behest of Jamila's touch. She guides him, fists tightly gripped around crumpled note cards, from behind the podium, down the stairs, and back into the alcove. When it is just them, when the weight of it all plummets from him like raindrops, Jamila looks up at Marcus and says, well done. Thank you. Akila, that was amazing. I, I love the fact that every little detail is so perfect for revealing the world that Marcus lived in. And Robbie mentioned in the comments, and I hope you go read the comments for all of the amazing things people said about this piece. The cadence of the piece is poetic. It's just absolutely gorgeous. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. Thank you. Uh, I, I'm really, really grateful to you for that. Thank you. Uh, our next reader is Fabia Oliveira. And I have the pleasure of introducing Fabia. Uh, she graduated from Leslie's MFA nonfiction track in January of 2017. And her essays have appeared in Rigorous, a journal by people of color. Your Impossible Voice, The Crab Orchard Review, Indian River Review, and Post Road Magazine. Her essay, A Blue Wall, won second place in Juncture Workshops she was a semifinalist for the Ruminant Vandermeer Nonfiction Prize, as well as a scholarship recipient for the inaugural Sag Harbor Nonfiction Writers Conference. She is also a Luso American Fellowship recipient to the Disquiet International Conference in 2019. Fabia lives with her three children in Somerville, Massachusetts, and it is my great pleasure to turn things over to her so we can hear her incredible work. Thank you so much. I'm a little nervous to follow up Akila after that stunning reading though, right? No? Sweet. Okay. Um, I'm gonna be reading this essay that I wrote that is in uh, Post Road, um, but I'll be reading the newly edited version that I've cut out many necessary, unnecessary uh, paragraphs from mostly to make the time, but also because I think we needed it. So this essay is called Hunger. There on the shelf at eye level are the canned hearts of palm, palmitos, those white delicacies that are harvested from the inner core and growing buds of some palm trees. They are the same ones that I enjoyed handpicking as a child directly from the can, unraveling each stalk with a fingernail. I see the guava paste or goyabada in their flat round tins. It makes me think of my father as he would cut into the tin of hard red jelly with a knife, still slick with the butter he had spread on the rolls from the bakery, layer thick slices of the fresh farm cheese and the goyabada making sandwiches for my brother and me. I see too the jars of pickled vegetables floating in their briny liquid, blossoms of cauliflower, celery, thick slices of carrots and whole wrinkled peppers. At home, I used forks to get to the cauliflower from the jar and voided the rest. I get to the end of the aisle where five pound sacks of long grain rice line the bottom shelf. I have to pause. Countless times I watched my mother crouch low to gather the sacks of rice that were the staples of our 
daily meals, rice and beans. This was Brazilian. The preparation varied from household to household and the sense did too. Some prepared their stewed beans with bay leaves and their rice with sharp nose with cilantro. My mother made her rice with garlic. My father told me a joke in Portuguese and loosely translated, it goes something like this. A language arts teacher was going over a lesson with the class before their upcoming test. Suddenly aware of a very distracted student, he decides to test the boy. Mauricio, he called. Tell me something. Yes, instructor, rice. Is it with a C or an S? Mauricio sat for a long moment, rubbing his chin thoughtfully. And then with a sudden flash of brilliance, he said, I'm not sure instructor, but at home it's with beans. This process of translation echoed in our experiences. You cannot translate, I am hungry directly to the Portuguese language. Other phrases like, I am tired and I am happy can be. But to say you are hungry, you must say, eu tenho fome, which means I have hunger. Or else you say, estou com fome, which is to say hunger is with me. Hunger then seemed to represent something outside of you or what you bring with you, but never for some reason an identifier. My mother did not purchase goods packaged to attract children. Protests from my brother and I ensued in the cookie and cereal box aisle. Isso não é comida, my mother would say. That's not food. When I would beg for a box of cookie crisps, it was my father who would help us gain footing in the battle against my mother's determination to feed us an exclusively non-American diet. Instead of dropping us off to do other obscure dad errands, he started joining us at Market Basket. And once he did, he could be found adding to our cart, cartons of ice cream, packages of Oreos, and the once forbidden boxes of cereal we begged for. His sweet tooth was not easily satisfied. Entire cans of Eagle brand sweetened condensed milk would disappear from the fridge in one week's time. Two tiny incisions would be on end, opposite ends of the lid, one for him to gulp directly from and the second to allow the air to escape. The stuff was so sweet. There would always remain a layer on the back of your tongue, leaving the hint of sugar in your mouth all day. Eu quero pai, my brother and I would chant. We want some, we want some. He would shrug his skinny shoulders. His body always slim, no matter how many cans of condensed milk he consumed and pour out the globs of the stuff onto spoons for us. And sometimes when he was feeling playful directly into our laughing open mouths. My father, like my brother and I, wanted to embody the authentic American experience and food was a way for him to do so. These sweets became part of his and inevitably our daily consumption. No matter what he tried though, American sweets could not satisfy the way desserts from his homeland could. I started to resent that rice and bean life by the time I was 10. Away from our two bedroom apartment with the matted deep blue rugs, I would roam the neighborhood and imagine the biggest house is mine. A friend from school, Kirsten lived at the bottom of the long sloping hills from our apartment building. She had stray red hair and small green eyes that sat behind thick glasses. We were both chubby girls, though she was a dancer and I was not. In gym class, she could silently, she would silently rehearse her routine while the rest of the class play, played kickball. I didn't like sports at all. So I would stare around with her while she danced to music no one but she could hear, and we became friends. When I visited her home for the first time, I set to taking in every detail of how they lived. I stared for a long time at the glass case of precious moments figurines, all alabaster and pastels. The tear-shaped eyed figures sat in different poses, praying, tiny brides and grooms and angels. Standing together the way they were, they looked like a tiny army of unhappy children. Pictures of the four red-headed girls lined every wall. Class photos, dance photos, and holiday portraits taken at Bradley's. I turned to find Kristen's mother with the baby on her hip watching me. 
You want to stay for dinner? How do I say your name? Is it Fabia? It's more like Fabia. I, I just have to call my parents and tell them. I used their phone in the kitchen, twirling the cord around my finger, and I whispered in Portuguese as quietly as I could to my father on the land that I was doing homework and having dinner at a friend's house. Okay, ciao, I said as I hung up the phone. You speak Spanish? Her mother asked me with eyebrows raised in sudden interest. Mm, Portuguese. At the dinner table, I sat next to Kristen who was unaware of any discomfort I might be feeling as I listened to her parents talk about a leak that kept happening in their New Hampshire lake house. Her father was a large bald man with an orange mustache. His hoarse voice didn't seem callous to me. In its grainy quality, there was also a kind of jolliness behind it. He loved his brood of girls and it was obvious. So Fabia, how long have you been in America? We came when I was a baby, so I guess 10 years, I said. I took a bite of the now tepid green beans I desperately wanted to pour salt on. You want something to drink? Her mother asked me from across the table. Yeah, do you have Coke? The family looked at me and looked at each other in quiet glances. Only the father laughed. The girls only drink milk or water with dinner and you're a bit too young for a beer. Oh, at home we drink Coke and my parents don't drink beer, I said. Tell me something, her father asked between bites. How come all the Brazilians around here are so loud when they leave that club of theirs down the street? Every night, it's like they don't have to get up for work in the morning. I didn't know there was a club down the street. My parents don't really go out. They just go to church. My heart was pounding suddenly, like I was some sort of informant being questioned. All those hours of hearing my parents talking in paranoid whispers about status and maintaining a low profile, became a sharp point of preference, reference in my mind. Like sirens going off. I felt it swiftly with the prickling in my skin. You do not belong here. Do any of them speak English? All I hear when I walk down the street is them speaking Spanish. Oh, I know, I hate that, I chimed in, hoping to make them like me and to know that I was nothing like those foreigners. I was not like my parents who came here and are said not to assimilate fast enough. I was different, American. He was trying to bridge some sort of gap that existed for him in understanding these people. But I couldn't help but feel I was betraying my parents somehow. Resentment settled in the pit of my stomach while I tried to finish my cold milk, missing the sweetness of cola and of home. I liked Kristen, but I liked being in her house more. It was as if by osmosis, her lifestyle would transform me into an authentic American. We were doing arts and crafts one afternoon when she led me to her pantry to get supplies. I was embarrassed not to know what a pantry was. The word was foreign to me. And in that moment, I remember learning the word cupboard when I was three years old, enrolled in Head Start. The English word blooming in my mind and taking hold there, becoming sturdily fixed and understood. My lack of understanding now of pantry created an instant embarrassment of just how different, how less than I believe my world was to hers. At our apartment in our kitchenette, we had cupboards for all the ingredients necessary for my mother to cook for us, whether cakes, crusts, sauces, breads, or salgadinhos. The often deep fried, heavily breaded, and salty treats she made when she was in the mood. The meager shelves stored red and yellow Bustello, espresso coffee cans, shiny gold foiled rolls, of Goya's Maria cookies and some bottles of spices. All of our prepared food was kept in our refrigerator. I now marveled at the labels and cartoons of all the products in her pantry. Chef Boyardee in his ridiculous pastry chef hat, Count Chocula, a kangaroo festoon and cool sunglasses on the box of Dunkaroos, Gushers candies with the rainbow colored bursts of liquid propping up on the gem shaped candies. It was American kid consumer heaven. One day after school, while we were sitting on our steps, eating the PB&J sandwiches her mother had prepared for us on sliced Wonder Bread, she leaned over and with sisterly affection kissed a mean scratch I had on my knee. Maybe the sweetness of her actions mixed with the sweetness of that very American food made the memory last as long as it did. But I know for sure that from then on, I made my mother buy and prepare those sandwiches for me for years to come. Childhood can be a difficult terrain to, 
terrain to navigate when you don't understand not only the world around you, but your own desire to be anyone but yourself. Nowhere is this truer than in public school setting where you are a minority. There was only a small number of Hindu kids at our elementary school. Small, such a small number, in fact, that in our school, sorry guys, such a small number, in fact, that in our classroom, there was only one student, Samar, who had an accent and whose parents had come from India. Although he was born here, we shared the same experience of growing up in a home that maintained a foreign culture's traditions. We were 12 years old, crass, and hateful in the way only self-conscious preteens can be. The boys in class, predominantly white, and by white, I mean Irish American, Italian American, Portuguese American, several generations now assimilated, were sometimes unfriendly to those who were distinctly foreign or different. One time in class, he made the mistake of bringing curry dish in his brown bag lunch. Oh man, that stinks so bad. The boys circle around him, pinching their noses, shut, covering their mouths as if to block out the offending odor. No, it doesn't, he protested, taking each and every item of his bag to his nose, trying desperately to smell what they smell. The giggles that tormented, that tormenting sound of children laughing at a singled out peer was eventually, but I think not soon enough, broken up by the teacher. The next day, Samar opened his snack and three boys were ready to pounce on him wanting an encore of the previous day's entertainment. One pale boy, short, sturdy, with fingernails bitten down to odd looking stubs, reached for his bag and took out the blue teeny bottle of corn syrup and water we called juice and sniffed it. He put perfume on his snack. That was all it took to set those same boys, his friends into hysterics. Samara lives in California now with the beautiful wife and two daughters. We talked about the irony of how popular Indian restaurants have become when I emailed him about writing this essay on food and feeling left out. After that incident at school, I spent an inordinate amount of time inhaling deeply when I walked into our apartment. The distinct smell of food, the homes of other Brazilians I knew once a sign of a good meal to come now led to anxiety. Did my clothes smell like them when I left? Imagine that smell condensed, lingering in walls that don't have proper ventilation for the level of cooking these families were doing. It seems like these tenement building architects didn't consider in their blue pans, blue plans, blueprint plans, how the smell of cooking with hot splattering oil and with ingredients whose aromas are meant to call their guests from a distance would affect the lives of those so closely packed, packed together. It seems we can never smell our own home scent. Try as we might, even after a long time away and you return, and the only thing that registers is a sweet aroma of home, that is to say, of no smell at all. I even try to ask a friend if my house smelled weird, but who would admit a thing like that to a friend? My mother cooked most of our meals at home, but outings to restaurants for us meant eateries that could be found in the food courts of the shopping mall. Establishments such as Sparrow's Pizza, Sarko Japan, Burger King, Panda Express, and Old Country Buffet. We feasted in the true mecca of global fast foods. Cheap, filling, and exotic. We couldn't get enough of it. I know this is true because my parents asked some passing strangers to take pictures of us in the brassy light of the food court. My mother in her long camel colored wool coat and kitten heels. My father tan and slender with his thick mustache appears in them sitting in a dark suit and a burgundy tie. In front of him are a disposable lidded soda and a styrofoam container with the portions of chicken teriyaki and pork fried rice separated into least, less than neat sections. We ate with plastic utensils in our Sunday best. Today I eat almost anywhere but these food courts. I've come to love a good restaurant. I've tried to take my parents out for dinner in any restaurant that requires reading a menu and it's always the same. My pointing out what they might try and my parents with their reading glasses on, tensely scanning the menu and correcting each other about what they thought each entree actually was. I don't go to Brazilian restaurants much anymore either. When I do, it's to satisfy a Brazilian uh, friend's craving uh, I have lunch plans with. And always it's my Portuguese friend with this craving. Let's get Brazilian, she'll say, and I'll roll my eyes and agree, but only after an initial back and forth about whether I want it or not. I do 
and then I don't. And every time I wonder why this dissonance. Growing up, my family often ate at these mom and pop operated Brazilian lunchonetes. There we ate rice and beans and stewed fish. We ate cuts of barbecued beef and fried bananas. We had bitter shredded collard greens and starchy mashed polenta. We ate tangy sausages covered in grease. We ate beets that stained our white rice pink. We ate with a sensation that maybe we're eating among our extended family since the only customers of these restaurants like us were other Brazilians. My father joked with the kitchen staff with an ease and charm I rarely saw when we spoke to our American neighbors or customers of his home cleaning business. Here, my father told jokes that sent the young pretty waitresses into fits of laughter and set my mother's eyes rolling at his incessant, if harmless, flirtations. At home, like at these Brazilian restaurants, the longest standing of which were named Oasis, Oliveiras, and Brantas, we ate as a family with cold, cans of Guarana, and we watch Brazilian news and novellas, the weekly recordings on VHS purchased at the bodega on the television that was perched in the corner. And just like one truly feels at home and never notices the smell their cooking may leave behind, I never once felt odd or unwelcome or foreign in these moments and in these places. It was the acceptance and rightful belonging I could not name, but always craved, always felt a hunger for. Fabia, thank you. Uh, that was incredible. And the density, the layers of all of the different interactions with food, the way it reflected your experience, your family's experience, it was beautiful. Thank you so much. And uh, please feel free to have your, uh, your mini me join us because she's not going to stop up until you do. <laughs> uh, thank you, Fabia. And now uh, it's, it's my distinct pleasure to introduce the one and only Lisa Pegram. Lisa is a writer, educator, literary publicist, and the author of Cracked Calabash, which is a marvelous collection. Um, I can't recommend picking up a copy enough. It's just beautiful and lyrical. Um, but getting back to Lisa, uh, she has over 20 years of experience in program design for organizations including the Smithsonian, the Corcoran Gallery of Art, and National Geographic. She served as DC Writer Corps Program Director for a decade. Lisa has completed an executive certification in arts and culture strategies at UPenn in 2018. She writes poetry and creative nonfiction, often with a focus on food and wellness. And she is the original creator of the Leslie MFA Posse on Facebook. So we all have her to thank for that. Uh, she's beaming in from Curacao to join us tonight. So Lisa, thank you. I can't wait to hear your work. Thank you so much. And it's so lovely to be here with all of you. Okay, so speaking of Cracked Calabash, I'm going to read a few poems from Cracked Calabash because, uh, most importantly, because um, it was published by Central Square Press, which is the press that was started by my very dear Leslie alum friend, Enzo Silen Surin. So I'd like to share this book and say, if you have the opportunity to go to the Central Square Press website and check out all the beautiful chapbooks there, you will be treating yourself honestly to the wonderful work that Enzo is putting out into the world. So I'm going to start, since it's about that, a little bit after that time of day, I'm gonna start with a poem called After Dinner. What is said in conversation when all of the women leave the room? Satin glove slipped from fist, an uncut deck of cards. The men show their teeth, mark opinions like territory, laugh upside down, wrinkles shape-shifting between stone, wood, and flesh. 
This cut and paste debate sits in the shade of cigar smoke, sips dark liquors neat, no chaser, spans home front and auction block. Laughter and shit talk roll like distant thunder make bridges of fragments and in guarded embraces as quick as they are firm. Okay. And the next poem is called, is titled Latte. Grind the crime, strong and dark, into obedient powder, spoon into filter, press, fill the mouth with boiling water until all that's left is confession, inadmissible. Pour into ceramic cup, set aside. Steam milk gently, take care to decrease heat before foam begins to rise. Drown blackness until all that's left is fleeting shadow. Add sugar to taste or not. While cooling, say 10 Hail Marys. Sip slowly, relish bitterness at the bottom. Okay, um, this next one is called Mario. We dance barefoot, Remedios Vado to the east, Jimi Hendrix to the west. Drinking white wine tinged with green, we crack a hairline in our salute eye to eye and hit the table. Listen, broccoli spores and burnt garlic that clings to ears of orecchietti pressed to the bowl. You made a bowl out of a carrot and an apple and a Casi soda can. May West backed by Duke Ellington on vinyl. In clean dish towels, we wring out defrosted spinach, tossed with raisins, Parmesan and pine nuts. Line a glass pie pan with stretched dough, slicing veins into tiny leaves cut out of the extra. Y ahora las berenjenas. That day before New Year's Eve, when we bought panettone, a case of Prosecco, and stopped by the Botanica Cubana, porque ese chico presumido no sabía quién eres. The bunches of sage we dried upside down to burn in his footsteps. Flowers for tea to wash your hair. Your ex who said no problem came over, blue cigar smoke, spit rum and feathers, spent the night. Expensive cheese and chocolate with sea salt, the cutting board, a lychee anchovies dressed in lemon and white lace, a tiny ceramic bowl for olive pits. I have never met your mother but pledge allegiance to her tiramisu. Sun salutations on a roof in India at dawn, the sleeping courtyard, the garlands of laundry like prayer flags, taunting the darkness as if it were a bull. Mariu, who loves tiny things, charms and trinkets that fit in the palm of a fist, closed and raised to the sky. So this next one is called Kibrahacha and it is named after the local tree of Curaçao, which is the Caribbean island where I now live. And Kibrahacha translates to literally to ax breaker because it is said that the trunk of the tree is so strong that it can literally break an ax. Kibrahacha. And it starts with a quote from Zora Neale Hurston and then again, when I'm looking mean and impressive. Folks know me best as Aquarius, water bearer that pours all the 
Namaste, Om Shanti to soothe and cleanse a weary soul. But don't get it twisted. Even a sponge has a saturation point. My rising sign is Leo. These locks are both antenna for positive energy and the most fiery of maids. I be the granddaughter of Margaret and her daughter named after her, Margaret, meaning pearl, a gem born from a grain of sand that struggles and grinds to make the world its oyster. Our matriarch executed a whole revolution around a table set for 12 with crystal, silver, and china, all that cut deep when sharpened or broken. I be the daughter of Raymond, whose name means wise protector or mighty, whose fist is the size of a lion's paw, whose horns bear the mark of Taurus and whose personal motto is, I play for keeps. I be the echo of Fannie Lou, Tony and Angela, Lao Tzu and Tula taught me. I don't choose between Malcolm and Martin I keep the peace, but if you look for me, you will find me. A monk is a sage, but so is a warrior. Beware the crouching tiger and the hidden dragon. I be the Kibrahacha, Curacao's native tree whose bark breaks axes and the backs that swing them. I be the queen of the chessboard, the only piece that moves any way she wants. Cuando tú llegaste, ya yo me iba con la maleta. When you arrived, me and my suitcase were already gone. The same match I used to light copal may also burn your house down. I am Palo Santo, my power not extinguished, but unleashed by the flame. I don't run from the smoke. I bathe in it. I be Aquarius, water bearer, but my rising sign is Leo, born of fire. And contrary to popular belief, Aquarius bears the water, but is an air sign. So I be the fire and the air that makes it rage. I be not the sea, but the breath beneath the moon's call that bids it move. I am not sure. Okay, and I have one, I have one last one. Um, yes, that was written. Um, one of these wake you up in the middle of the night in response to our current reality. It's called breathe. Yes, grieve. Yes, mourn. Yes, rage, yes, howl, yes, storm. Yes, cry, yes, sigh, yes, curse. Yes, refuse, yes, demand. Yes, tend the fire, yes, stand. Yes, but also turn inward, breathe, hydrate, recharge, meditate, exfoliate, breathe, move, sweat, Soak, crack a joke, laugh, pray, stretch, breathe, eat whole foods, grab the hot sauce, walk barefoot in nature, put your hands in some soil, sit on the stoop or porch, make love, make art, get fly, praise the mirror, sleep, breathe, get daily sunlight, limit screen time, fellowship, call an elder, Call someone who calls you baby. Call the ancestors. Oil your scalp, oil your skin, lift your head. We cannot fight or claim victory if we surrender our health, our joy, our light. Self-care is serious collective business, so breathe. Close the door, open the windows, put the needle on the record, play the music loud, write it to the source our song, our dance, our swag, our rhythm, our bass, our groove, our roots, our frequency. After all this time, it remains elusive. It remains untouched. Go there, rest in the swell of its bosom, rock in the cradle of its hips, bask in its vibration, 
but it may raise yours. Breathe. Thank you. Oh, Lisa, thank you. That was amazing. I knew it would be amazing. And I'm, I've still got goosebumps after getting to hear you read that. Thank you so much for coming all the way from Curacao tonight to be with us and to share that. Um, check out the comments, see what folks are saying in the chat because you don't want to miss that. And I dropped the link to Central Square Press so you can get a copy of Cracked Calabash for yourselves, folks. It's in the chat. Go ahead and get that book. You will, you will not be sorry. Uh, and next up, Julia is going to introduce our next reader. All right, hello again. So I am very pleased to introduce Jasmine Warga. Jasmine graduated from Leslie in June 2013 with an MFA in writing for young people. She is the author of the New York Times bestseller, Other Words for Home, which has earned multiple awards, including a John Newberry honor, a Walter honor for young readers, and a Charlotte Huck honor. Other Words for Home has received a multitude of praise, including from the Kirkus Review, which stated that Warga portrays with extraordinary talent the transformation of a family's life before and after the war began in Syria. Her free verse narration cuts straight to the bone and confronts the difficult realities of being Muslim and Arab in the US. Poetic, immersive, hopeful. Jasmine's young adult books have been translated into over 25 different languages. And her next novel for middle grade readers, The Shape of Thunder, will be published in May 2021 by Harper's Collins Publishers. We are thrilled to have her read tonight. So up next, Jasmine Warga. Thank you, Julia. Thanks, um, Michael, for setting this all up. I'm thrilled to be here tonight. And I'm in awe of the work that we heard earlier. Um, and yeah, just really, really enjoying it. So thank you to everyone who uh, set this up. Um, I'm gonna start by just reading um, one really short part uh, from Other Words for Home. Uh, which I was going to explain what it's about, but Julia's lovely introduction, if you like, did that for us, so I uh, will just go ahead and start. America is full of new things, glittery, blinking, in-your-face things. Everything in America moves fast and is loud. Cars honking, traffic lights flashing, big billboards advertising, hamburgers, drinks, an entirely new life. It seems like everything, everyone is trying to sell you something. Sometimes I feel dizzy with want. Sometimes I just feel dizzy. Aunt Michelle takes us shopping at a mall that feels like it is larger than my entire town back home. When I say this to mama, she scoffs and tells me our town is not that small. But when she doesn't know I'm looking, I see her eyes fill with wonder as she takes in the cold air conditioned stores each one bigger, fancier than the last. In America, it seems like everyone has money. New shiny sneakers, bright colored lipstick, pants that fit just right. Then I start to notice the man on the corner with a sign begging people for help. The tired woman waiting for the bus with shoes that are cracked at the sole. America, I realize, has its sad and tired parts too. America, like every other place in the world, is a place where some people sleep and some people, other people dream. Okay, and now um, I'm gonna read from my new book, which is called The Shape of Thunder, um, and it's coming out in May. And uh, because it hasn't been published yet, I'm still not that great at summarizing it, but I guess sort of the elevator summary would be that it is about um, two best friends, Cora and Quinn, whose friendship has been fractured after a small, uh, after a school shooting happens in their small Ohio town. And so the book um, is about the reality of gun violence, uh, but it's also about time travel and science that feels like magic and um, the beauty and life-saving power of friendship. So um, I'm gonna read from chapter two. The book um, actually alternates perspectives um, between Cor and Quinn, and this is Quinn's first chapter. Dear Parker, I only ever saw you cry once. 
It was in the woods. It was after you helped me down from the tree. Do you remember? Dad always told us not to cry, especially you. The time I saw you cry, it wasn't because you were sad. I haven't cried since it happened, but I'm pretty sure I'm going to cry when I see you again. Your sister, Quinn. It's been three days since I put the box on Cora's doorstep and I still haven't heard anything from her. The last bell of the day rings and I jolt toward the library. As I scramble to get there before anyone spots me, I imagine the scene being narrated by one of those voices from the boring documentaries we sometimes watch at school. The kind of voice that speaks in a stiff and funny sounding way, like Quinn McCauley races down the tire, tiled halls in the hopes that none of her classmates will notice her before she's once again disappeared from view. Hi Quinn, Mrs. Euclid greets me as I walk into the library. Before last year, I hardly ever went to the school library. I guess because I never thought of myself as a great reader or language arts student. Whenever I get one of my writing assignments back, there's so much red on it, circling all the things I did wrong, that it looks like it's bleeding. I mean, I think I have okay ideas, but I'm never able to get them down without lots of spelling and grammar mistakes or something else wrong. I lose track of my thoughts a lot. I have so many of them that by the time it comes to write them down, it ends up coming out all wrong and my teachers start to think I don't have any thoughts at all. I'm also never able to memorize facts from books, so I sometimes do badly on reading quizzes. I mean, I could tell you why I liked the book or why I didn't or how I felt about the characters, but my teachers always want to know things like what color glasses the main character wore, and those are the type of details that slip my mind. Those are also the type of details my brain forgets when I get nervous, and I'm always nervous during quizzes. Anyway, I didn't think the library was for me. I figured it was only for kids like Cora, who are really good at school. But after last November, I started coming in here all the time. And when school started back up this year, I found myself here again. I figured out that I kind of love the library, the long line of shelves, the quiet hum of the ceiling fan and the smell. The library totally smells a certain way, kind of musty, but also welcoming. It smells like a place where you can belong. I sit down at a table in the back and Mrs. Euclid pushes a card of books toward me. We just got a book in that I think you'll like. Really? Mrs. Euclid smiles and I notice her bright colored purple lipstick. Mrs. Euclid is black and wears her hair in long box braids that almost reach her waist. Today she has on earrings shaped like BB-8 and her shoes are ballet flats that look like mice. Mrs. Euclid always has the best shoes. It's on your favorite topic, time travel. She reaches down and fishes a book off the cart. She hands it out to me. The cover has a boy standing in the middle of a light tunnel. He travels all the way back to the Jurassic era. Pretty cool, huh? I turn the book over in my hands. I stare at the boy on the cover and irritation itches inside me. This boy did what I want to do. Also, for some reason, it's almost always a boy on these type of, these type of books. Super annoying. I point at the cover. Isn't that kind of a spoiler? How so? Because he's standing in that light tunnel. So we already know that he managed to time travel. Why should I read the book? Mrs. Euclid laughs a little. I think the book is more about what happens after he time travels, not so much about whether or not he's able to. Hmm. I'm not sure this book will be that useful for my research, but I think Mrs. Euclid anyway. I can hear the kids talking in the hallway outside the library. Once upon a time, this was my favorite part of the day. School can be tough because it's so much sitting, so much stillness, so much pretending to pay attention. Sometimes it's like I get in trouble in school because I'm always thinking when I'm supposed to be learning. So the end of the day, it was the absolute best. It's when I got to see all, see all my friends. Cora has always been my best friend, but I used to have other friends too, lots of them actually like Scarlett and Ainsley, who I played soccer with on the weekends. And after our games, we'd beg our parents to take us out for ice cream. And then we'd have a sleepover at Ainsley's house, building massive pillow, fort, pillow forts in her basement. And there was Jacob and Bia and Emerson. We'd all been friends since kindergarten. Last year, before it happened, I ate lunch with them every day and then played tetherball with Bia at recess. I was always a better player than Bia, but I sometimes let her win when I knew she was having a bad day. Now none of those kids talk to me. They talk about me, sure, but they don't talk to me. It's okay though. I even kind of actually get it. 
Like they can't look at me and not see what my brother did. And I mean, I can't look at me and not see what Parker did. So I don't really blame any of them, even though I'd be lying if I said it didn't feel like sandpaper scratching my skin every time one of them turns away in the hall, pretending like they don't know me. But like I said, it's okay. It's okay because I'm going to fix it. Mom has this lipstick that's a shade of red called Leading Lady. Back before everything happened, when mom was still busy with work, she would wear that lipstick. She said it was a bright spot that could get her through, through even the toughest and hardest of days. It was a fake it until you make it sort of thing. That's how I feel about this plan. You see, whenever I think about Parker, I end up missing him so much I feel sick. I feel sick because what kind of person misses someone who did what Parker did? And then my sickness turns to anger, an anger so hot that I feel like I could spit lava. When my anger gets that hot, I go back to thinking about my plan and boom, bright spot, the lava cools down. It's actually better than a bright spot. It's a changer of spots. It's a fixer, my plan. I call it my plan, but really it's Cora's. She's the one who has always been interested in time travel. That's how I came up with this whole thing. One night I was sitting at the computer listening to mom and dad argue about the things that they keep promising to one another they won't argue about in front of me money, the guns, everything with Parker. And I didn't want to listen to them anymore, so I distracted myself by clicking on a random article after random article. Mom teases me that I turn into a zombie when I'm on the computer, clicking from one thing to another. I used to find that joke funny, but then Parker actually did become infected by things on the internet. And when I think about that, I get that lava vomiting feeling again. Anyway, I don't really know how I found the article. Maybe I was missing Cora and somehow that led me there. I guess I saw the headline and it seemed like something she might be interested in. So I clicked on it, even though I knew I wouldn't understand all the sciencey language. I clicked on it because I hoped that reading it would make me feel like I was talking to her again. Even with all the sciencey language, I was able to understand a few things. I was able to understand that a very smart scientist who worked at one of those super famous schools, the type of school that Cora talks about wanting to go to for college, was saying that time travel was possible. He used all these other strange words like wormholes and the fabric of our universe and light speed. But what struck me was the word possible. Even a girl like me who doesn't understand a lot of sciencey terms knows what possible means. Possible means it's real. Possible means it could happen. I remember in fourth grade, my teacher, Mrs. Banks, told us about this old guy in ancient Greece named Archimedes who shouted Eureka in the bathtub when he figured out the answer to a really tough math problem. Since I'm never the one who figures out the really tough math problem, that story was sort of lost on me. But as I read this interview with this very smart scientist, I whispered, Eureka, this was it. This was the solution. Time travel was possible and I was going to do it. I wish I could say that I started my research that night, but I didn't, that all came later. Instead, I ran to the cork board in my room where I keep old photos of Cora and me. My cork board is a collection of things that I love. On it, I pinned a small poster of the US women's soccer team, the menu from my favorite hamburger place, a picture of my soccer team from last year, and one of me with my mom on a beach in North Carolina when we were visiting Gammy and Papa. I used to have a photo of my whole family, but I took it down last November. I couldn't stand to look at my brother's face. And the rest of my cork board is filled with photos of Cora and me. Even after it happened, even after Cora stopped talking to me, I didn't take down any of the pictures. There are photos of us at all ages, including what I think is the first picture of us ever. It's from Cora's birthday party when she turned two. That was her first birthday after her mom left. I never met her mom, or if I did, I don't remember. I don't remember the party either, but I've always loved this picture because it proves that Cora and me go way back. I would look at it whenever I felt moody that she was spending so much time after school with the talented and gifted club, or wasn't able to eat lunch with me because she'd been invited to a special pizza party that was only for kids who got an A on the math test. It helped remind me that she really was my best friend, my best friend since forever. In the photo, my face is smeared with chocolate cake and my white freckled arms are squeezing Cora's waist. Cora is smiling perfectly for the camera and there isn't even a speck of chocolate icing around her lips. While my striped purple shirt has sloppy brown splotches all over it, her pink dress is completely unstained. 
My light red hair was already long, falling in front of my face in a tangled mess. Cora's hair hadn't come in all the way yet, but you could already tell that it was going to be thick and curly like her dad's. She has the same dark olive skin tone too. Grams has always said that Cora's golden hazel eyes come from her mom, but I'm not sure. I just know that her and Mabel had the same eyes. Cora was always proud of that. After last November, looking at that photo felt like pressing on a bruise. I would see it and it would remind me of everything that was lost. But that night, after I read the article about time travel, I saw potential when I looked at that photo. I saw the word possible. Maybe Cora and I had become friends for this very reason, because we were meant to fix everything. Eureka, I repeated, staring at our two-year-old faces. Thank you. Thank you, Jasmine. That was marvelous. I, I got completely caught up in the inner workings, the, the psychology of these characters. And now I really need to pre-order the book so that I can find out more. Um, I'm completely sucked in. I can't wait for May. Thank you so, so much for sharing that with us. Um, and folks, the, the link to pre-order the book through bookshop.org is in the chat. Take a look at it, get it for yourself, get it for somebody who is of that age group and needs to read this book because they're out there and they'll appreciate you for it. Uh, Jasmine, thank you again, and I am going to turn this over to Tyler Dean Kemp, who will introduce our final reader for the evening. Thank you, Michael, and thank you, Jasmine. I honestly cannot wait to read that book. It's so good. Um, uh, I just want to say real quick before I, I move forward that I am so grateful for this space. Um, I sometimes forget how much I miss Leslie, and then we have these readings, and it reminds me of those nights in the theater when I'm introduced to so many voices that I'm not uh, familiar with, or the, just experiences and perspectives that are so new to me. And it's just invigorating and exciting. And everybody tonight has been so talented. I'm just so happy to be here tonight. So thank you to everybody who's read so far and to everybody who's supporting them tonight. This space is just, it makes me very happy and gives me energy that I need right now during this terrible time. Um, so hello everybody, my name is Tyler and I have the amazing honor of introducing my friend and genre cohort counterpart, uh, Tata Mosa. Uh, now, originally from Botswana, Tato is an illustrator, a documentarian, a screenwriter, and a filmmaker. Now, she won the coveted Emerging Filmmaker Award at the 2005 Roxbury Film Festival for her film, Don't Tell Me You Love Me. Tato is a finalist for the 2019 Mass Cultural Arts Fellowship in the Dramatic Writing category. And her first narrative feature, Memoirs of a Black Girl, completed in late 2020 and is now making the 2021 Film Festival rounds. I've seen the trailer. It looks amazing. Her husband's in it. He looks really cute. Uh, now, I have a question for all of you. Um, this question is a trivia question. I'm going to ask this trivia question, then I'm going to ask you to try to put your, your best guess to the answer in the chat. So your trivia question is... Who is known as the queen of African pop? Who is known as the queen of African pop? If you know, oh, I do throw know it in it. the chat. I remember. If you know it, throw it in. I do know it. There's a couple answers there that aren't there just yet. No one's gotten it yet. There it is. Stella got it right. Yeah, and Tony, you got it right as well. Oh, that's amazing. I hope you didn't Google it. I hope you didn't Google it. I hope you know it. But if you Google it, that's fine too, because now you know. Uh, now, this trivia question comes from this board game right here called Sawat, African trivia card game created by Tato. That's right. Uh, it is a super fun game. It is super educational, and my dogs love it too. They're clearly go excited for this board game. Um, the, the, thank you, Michael, for putting the, the, uh, the link in there. I was about to do that as well. If you would like to order this board game, I highly recommend it. It is wonderful when you are stuck in your home and looking for a new, different experience. Check that out. Uh, that's enough of shilling all of Tato's things. Um, please welcome my talented friend, Tato Mosa. Well, that was awesome, Tyler. Thank you. And I, the readers were so, so, so great. Um, Thank you, Michael and uh, 
Cambridge Common Writers for putting this together. I am excited to be here tonight. Uh, and since I wrote a screenplay, I will not be reading. Um, I have actors that are here to read the screenplay and, and I'll introduce them. And I have a, um, a reader who will be doing the stage direction, uh, Wendy Ewen, um, who was um, with us um, for um, at Leslie, and then I have um, Anne Ken, who is going to read um, for the role of Ati. I have Joyce Torres, who is going to read for the role of Mara. And my screenplay, um, I just finished writing it two weeks ago, been revising it. So when Michael asked me, I was like trying to figure out what to uh, choose for tonight, and I decided to go with it. Uh, it's called Thank You uh, for Your Application. And it's a short screenplay. Thank you for your application, written by Tato R. Mosa, based on the life of an artist. Ati will be read by Anne Aquila, and Mara will be read by Joyce Torres. Exterior, a suburban neighborhood, day. Ati, late 30s, a petite bodied black woman jogs out, jogs out of a wooded area. She slows down to catch her breath as she hears her destination, as she nears her destination on a tree-lined street with houses that have immaculate gardens. She checks her Fitbit, three miles, 35 minutes. She is satisfied with the results. Ati strolls down a sidewalk, stops to observe fall leaves that cling to the brittled branches of an oak tree. Her eyes follow a perfect yellow leaf cascading downwards. She catches it before it hits the ground, slips it in her sweatshirt pocket. Exterior, Ati's apartment building, day, later. Ati approaches a row of brownstone apartment buildings. A few kids play hide and seek. One kid crawls under a mountain of dead leaves. Ati is amused at the innocence and joys of childhood, nostalgic. From a distance, she spots the landlord, Marcus, 50, a portly built black man with a receding hairline. She quickens her step to avoid him, barges into the building. Interior, Ati's apartment building lobby, day. Ati un unlocks her mailbox, which angrily spits out late bill notifications and some junk mail. One envelope from Film Femmes Foundation demands her attention. Her eyes light up in anticipation. Interior, Ati's kitchen, day later. Ati dumps the junk mail in a trash can and places the other mail in a drawer spilling with late bill notifications. She scrutinizes the envelope from Film Femmes, Femmes Foundation, grabs her phone to snap a picture of it. She texts the image to her friend Mara, a Hispanic woman in her late 30s. Ati's phone instantly rings, prompting her to pick up. Oh my God, did you get the grant? I don't know, I haven't opened it yet. So nervous. Girl, open it. What you waiting for? What if it's another rejection? It'll be the 10th one this year alone and we're only in March. Look, you'll continue being a badass filmmaker that you are. <laughs> right now I feel like an imposter. Are you serious? You're not an imposter, you're legit. Thanks, cheerleader. <laughs> but I told you, this is it. If I don't get this one, I give up on this crazy ass filmmaking journey. I don't know if I'll ever make this film. I have to need this grant money. You'll get it. But if you don't, I'll sell crack on the street to raise the money. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, crackhead. I'll take you up on that offer. Damn, you're so crazy. <laughs> and you love me for it. I sure do. Ati eyes the envelope in her hand. <sighs> Look, I gotta prep myself for this. Call you later. Ati hangs up. She turns to heat up a vintage metal kettle resting on a stove. She grabs an ornate wooden tea box from her cabinet. From the assortment of teas inside, she chooses chamomile and lavender. She gently pours the loose leaves into a tea leaf strainer, drops it inside the mug. Interior living room night. 
Auntie's living room is like a fortress. Ivy plants crawl down from the top of the window, entangling a rusty wooden bookshelf that houses filmmaking and screenwriting craft books. Floor plants are stored in crafty vases at every nook in her eclectic living space. Ati is slumped on the couch, a computer rests on her lap. She takes a quick sip of her steaming tea. She Googles. How many applicants are awarded the Film Femme Grant? The answers pop up on the screen. Only 2% of applicants get the Film Femme Grant. Ati slams shut her laptop and grabs the Film Femme envelope on her coffee table. She holds it up to the window, but fear paralyzes her from opening it. She throws it back down. Interior bathroom, night. Ati's naked silhouette is seen through a foggy, transparent shower curtain. She turns off the faucet and slips out, wrapping herself with a towel. She wraps her drenched, voluminous, curly hair with another. She eyes the sealed envelope by the sink, which is begging her to open it. She gazes at her reflection in the mirror. You must always visualize what you want. Ati closes her eyes, starts visualizing. Begin dream sequence. Ati reads the letter. Dear Ati, congratulations. We are pleased to inform you that you have won the 2021 Film Femme Grant. <laughs> Tears of joy jumps up and down. I did it, I did it. <laughs> End of dream sequence. Ati smiles at her reflection and eyes the untouched sealed envelope on the sink. Interior bedroom, night, later. Ati lies on her bed with her eyes fixed on the ceiling. The clock on her side table reveals it is 2 a.m. She tosses and turns, reaches for the envelope, which is underneath her pillow, gazes at it for a moment, uncertain if the contents will make or break her world. She shudders at the ladder, grabs her phone, Googles. What does a film femme acceptance letter look like? She reads responses, holds the envelope up to the light, gains courage to peel it open, measuring her time. She removes the folded letter, but panics. She slips it back inside the envelope, drops her head back on the pillow. Interior bedroom, morning. Ati silences the screaming alarm. She gazes at the opened envelope that kept her company for the night, grabs it, slips out of the bedroom. Interior living room, morning. Ati sits cross-legged on a yoga mat. She turns on meditation mantras and takes a couple of deep breaths as she follows the soothing voice on her phone. I am light. I am powerful beyond measure. I attract opportunities. I attract goodness. I am who I say I am. Beautiful inside, smart and talented. A buzz from her phone jolts Ati back to consciousness. She silences it, closes her eyes to resume her meditation, but text message alerts keep interrupting her Zen moment. She gives in, checks her phone. Mara texts Are you going to tell me what's up? I haven't opened it yet. She adds a nervous emoji. Do you want me to come over and open this damn thing for you? <laughs> Ati chuckles and responds with a laughing emoji. Mara texts a praying hand one. You got this, sis. Thank you, sis. <laughs> Kiss emoji. She picks up the letter and takes a deep breath. Please let this be it. She mumbles a little prayer before reading the letter. The magnified sentences. Thank you so much for your application. <clears throat> we regret to inform you. There were so many incredible applicants. We wish you the very best of luck. The disappointment on Ati's face is palpable. She rips the letter, falls back onto her yoga mat, lies flat on her back. Tears stream down the side of her face as she wallows in her sorrow for hours. Interior living room, evening, later. Ati is laying on the yoga mat where we left her, 
The phone rings. She ignores it. It persists. She turns it off. Sits up. Tears clog her eyes as she observes the parade of film trophies and filmmaking books on her bookshelf. Her eyes rest on the vintage film posters adorning her walls. She pulls herself up, hastily leaves the room, returns momentarily, clutching a trash bag. She violently dumps the books and small film trophies into the bag, rips the posters off the wall. She scours the living room for more film stuff, which she has decided are now remnants of her past life. Exhausted, she slides down the wall to the floor, her hand still clutching the trash bag. All that's left on the bookcase is a small framed photo of her mother, dressed in African attire, complete with head wrap. Ati's mom's voice echoes in her head. Ati, you have to be serious about life. You want to be a struggling artist? Who is going to support you when you can't pay your bills? Ati screams loudly to drown out her mother's voice as she punches the wall in frustration. She stays on the floor, emotionally drained. The only sounds are the ticking of the clock and the hissing of the radiator. The doorbell buzzes, startling her out of her stupor. Loud banging. Ati! Ati! More banging. She drags herself up, opens the door. Mara stands on the doorstep, holding a bottle of champagne and a bag of takeout. What the hell is going on? I've called you a hundred times. You had me worried. It's a no. Oh, hi. I'm so sorry. She puts down the bag to hug Ati. I knew it. <clears throat> I'm not good enough. You are good enough. You know these kinds of grants aren't for people like us anyway. And besides, you either have to know someone or suck a lot of dick to get in. <laughs> I suck. My mom was right. I should have been a lawyer. A miserable lawyer? Hell no. Listen to me. Don't let the rejections make you doubt yourself. You're a badass filmmaker. Repeat after me. I'm a badass filmmaker. I'm a badass filmmaker. No, 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 no. Say it like you believe it, bitch. I'm a badass filmmaker. Louder, put some power in it. I'm a badass filmmaker. <laughs> Better. Now, don't you ever forget that, bitch. It's their loss if they don't see your brilliance. <laughs> Thanks, son. You're gonna be okay. Mara picks up the bag. Jerk chicken makes everything better. Tonight, we're gonna cry it all out. Tomorrow, all those tears will be gone. <laughs> I appreciate you. You know I'm your bitch. <laughs> I'm starving. Let's eat. Into your living room morning, the next day. Empty wine bottles and takeout boxes lie scattered on the coffee table along with DVD covers. Ati wakes up on the couch, head pounding, goes to the fridge for some water, sees a sticky note stuck to the fridge. Remember that Ava DuVernay was rejected from the Sundance six times. Keep going, bitch. You're almost there. Ati smiles, texts Mara a thank you gift with a kiss. Exterior street, morning, later. Ati jogs through her neighborhood, listening to energetic house music on her headphones. She runs into the woods, up a hill and downwards, moving at a steady pace. She stops at a small pond to observe ducklings waddling behind their mother. Interior living room, morning. Ati enters the living room from her run. She unpacks her film books and puts them back on her shelf. She fixes the ripped film posters, taping them back on her wall. She opens her coffee table drawer, grabs a pile of rejection letters tapes the letters one by one on the wall, overlaying them haphazardly, creating a collage. Time lapse. Ati grabs a thick black marker and scribbles on the collage. She steps back to observe her work of art. Keep going. Stop waiting for permission to create. The end. Absolutely.
absolutely incredible work. All of you talked a brilliant, brilliant script. And Wendy, beautiful reading of the stage directions. And Joyce and Anne, I am so grateful for you joining us tonight and becoming honorary members of the Cambridge Common Writers family and really bringing your all to the screen and getting it out there. Um, I have I have been known to Google things like, why do poetry editors hate me? So I felt a little bit of that. <laughs> and um, just really, you know, three-dimensional characters interacting in a very wonderful way. If anyone would like to sign up to be my motivation coach and bring me jerk chicken, there is an opening available. <laughs> um, thank you, Wendy. Uh, but seriously, just what a beautiful, beautiful piece. And I cannot wait for Memoirs of a Black Girl, because this is just a taste of the amazing talent that you have, Tato, to bring these worlds into being. So thank you very much. Everyone who has been here tonight and read, thank you. You have really brought something magical into being here with all of the food synergy and just all of the incredible detail you've all packed into your work. Um, I'm just floored by how gorgeous everything was. And I want to just put in a couple of plugs before we, you know, open the floor up for just casual conversation, because I'm here to talk to all of you. And I want to hear how everybody is doing. But um, drop into the residency tomorrow night to hear student graduating readers, uh, including two Cambridge Common folks, Robbie and Rex, who will be reading tomorrow night. Um, and if you haven't yet been to the Cambridge Common Writers website, it's cambridgecommonwriters.org. And Leslie, MFA alums, if you're not on there yet, we'd love to have you on there. We'd love to know what you're doing. We'd love to be able to promote the work that you have going out into the world. This organization exists to celebrate and support you. And we couldn't be happier to do that work. And my one final shout out tonight is a thank you to all of the mentors who came to reconnect with alums tonight, to hear what alums are doing. Uh, our lives wouldn't be the way they are if it wasn't for our interactions with you throughout the program. So thank you for coming. 